Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to day two of the, the Chi workshop. Uh, in the first session, we will start with the talk with Kai Schmitz from Munster, and he's going to tell us about gravitational waves from metastable cosmic strings. Uh, take it away, Kai. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. yes. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to present some uh, recent work uh, in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. And as you can see here in the title, I will talk about uh, gravitational waves from metastable cosmic strings. Uh, and that talk is based on work and collaboration with these uh, three people here, Wilfried Buchmüller at DESI, Valerie Domke at CERN, and Hitoshi Morayama uh, at Berkeley. And you can find our papers uh, on the archive here, these three papers. However, before we turn to the actual topic of the talk, matter silver cosmic strings, uh, let me take a step back and review uh, the sort of standard ordinary case of stable cosmic strings and the associated uh, gravitational wave uh, spectrum. So to put us all on the same page, cosmic strings are a certain type of uh, topological defect, a cosmic defect that can form in the early universe. In the case of cosmic strings, the underlying production mechanism is the spontaneous breaking of a U1 symmetry in the early universe, for instance, in such a Mexican head type scalar potential. So you can imagine um, that we've got a scalar field that breaks the U1 symmetry, and after the phase transition, it lives down here on this circle. Uh, this is the vacuum manifold of this Mexican head potential. It has a non-trivial topology. That means the phase transition can lead to the production of these topological defects. So you can imagine how we map a circle here along uh, the vacuum manifold onto this contour in position space. And that contour and position space will enclose this one-dimensional object, um, the defect, the cosmic string, where the scalar field still lives at the top of the scalar potential. Uh, that's the symmetric point in field space. So along the cosmic string, um, the U1 symmetry has actually not been broken, and the old vacuum before the phase transition has been preserved. Now, after the formation of cosmic strings, these cosmic strings uh, organize themselves in a network. So here you see the uh, outcome, a snapshot of a numerical simulation of such a cosmic string network. That consists of long strings that you can see here, and those stretch across many Hubble horizons. So practically, they are infinitely long. Uh, but then these long strings, they can also intersect with themselves or with each other. And these so-called intercommutation events then lead to the production of closed string loops. And these are these little dots here in the simulation. Uh, closed loops chopped off from the long string network in the course of the evolution. And the entire network then reaches what is called a scaling regime. Uh, that's sort of a self-similar stage of evolution where all the important quantities of the network uh, scale as simple power laws of uh, one common scale, uh, time scale or the Hubble scale basically. Um, which makes it, uh, to some extent, pretty simple to describe the dynamics of such a network, apart from uh, yeah, uh, the details of uh, loop formation, etc. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, many properties are encoded in just a handful of uh, parameters, uh, the most important one being the cosmic string tension. So mu is the energy per unit length, the actual tension. And then if we multiply this by Newton's constant, G, uh, G times mu is a dimensionless quantity. Another important parameter is the size of these loops that you can see here in, in the network. And then typically the size of these loop can, loops can be quantified uh, in terms of their size at the time of formation, basically as a fraction of the Hubble length or Hubble horizon at the time of formation. And this is this dimensionless parameter alpha here. Now, uh, such a network of cosmic strings does lead to a uh, stochastic background of gravitational waves, and it's primarily uh, the closed cosmic string loops that are responsible for emitting gravitational waves. So here there's a cartoon of such a closed loop, and these loops, they oscillate in their fundamental uh, frequency, but also in higher harmonic modes, uh, and in this, these oscillations lead to the emission of gravitational waves. On top, you can have uh, localized features on the loops, such as cusps and kinks, and those emit directed bursts of gravitational waves into certain directions. And then if you sum over all these contributions, you obtain a stochastic background of gravitational waves that can persist up to the present day and may appear in our gravitational wave experiments. 
just a word of caution before we continue. Um, there's an ongoing debate in the literature how we are supposed to treat particle production uh, from closed loops in, in such a network. In principle, particle emission can be another efficient mechanism of energy loss next to emission of gravitational waves. And the more important or the more, um, uh, yeah, the more efficient energy loss via particle emission is, uh, the more suppressed is also the signal and gravitational waves. Um, in the following, I will just consider the simplest case of cosmic strings based on the number go to approximation, uh, which are basically uh, featureless cosmic strings that do not lead to any kind of particle emission. Uh, and in that sense, that's an optimistic estimate or scenario for the strength of the corresponding gravitational wave signal. Now, cosmic strings, in particular stable cosmic strings, have recently received a lot of attention uh, in view of new announcements made by Pulsar Timing Array, PTA collaborations. Uh, and that started roughly two years ago in September uh, 2020, uh, when the Nanograph PTA collaboration announced that they have found evidence, strong Bayesian evidence, for a new type of signal in the latest PTA data set. It's not quite clear yet whether this really is gravitational waves, what we're seeing there in the PTA data set. But certainly there's a new type of signal that's referred to as a common red process, some process that is common among all the pulses in the PTA, and that is particularly relevant at low frequencies. And if you interpret this new PTA signal as a first glimpse of primordial or stochastic gravitational waves at nanohertz uh, frequencies, uh, it can be easily explained in terms of gravitational waves coming from a cosmic string network. Uh, this is what we showed here in this paper, and then there's a very similar analysis uh, that also appeared on the same day and that reaches uh, the same conclusion. So we can explain the nanograph or the PTA signal uh, for typical values of this loop size parameter of around 0.1 if the cosmic string tension is in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 11 or 10 to the minus 10. Uh, so that's already uh, an interesting result, and it's, it's uh, yeah, uh, interesting to see that cosmic strings provide a viable interpretation of this PTA uh, signal. However, um, from a theory perspective, uh, we would uh, actually expect that uh, in many scenarios, cosmic strings are generated at, at higher energy scales. So, for instance, in the context of grand unification, uh, it may easily be that the underlying symmetry breaking scale is much higher of the order of 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 16 GeV. And that would point to a cosmic string tension of around 10 to the minus, uh, oops, uh, 10 to the minus seven or 10 to the minus eight. Um, in our analysis, actually, we can show, we can show that uh, such large values of the cosmic string tension are also compatible with the data, but that comes at a cost uh, we have to assume a pretty small value of alpha. So we have to work with pretty small loops. Uh, and then these are values of around 10 to the minus four or five, which are typically not seen in numerical simulations. There uh, you find typically much larger loops. Um, another observation is that if we take our signal in the PTA band and just extrapolate this to higher frequencies, uh, we find that this extrapolated gravitational wave spectrum uh, falls a bit short of the projected sensitivity of the current generation of ground-based interferometers such as LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra. Um, well, uh, if, if, uh, well uh, if we are lucky, that might just be uh, reality and then we can't do much about it. Uh, but at the same time, it's interesting to think about in which ways we could go beyond this simplest scenario of stable number go to strings and whether there are other, maybe even more realistic models of cosmic strings uh, that would allow us to achieve these large values of the cosmic string tension a, a bit more easily. And also models that would allow us to obtain a slightly larger signal uh, here in the LIGO frequency band. And, and that finally brings me to uh, the connection between cosmic strings uh, and grand unification, and in particular, uh, the idea of metastable uh, cosmic strings. So the first observation is that the phenomenology of the cosmic string network uh, becomes much richer once you take your simple U1 toy model of cosmic string generation and embed this into a full-fledged microscopic theory, for instance, uh, your preferred uh, gut model. Uh, and that can be done, for instance, in the context of SO10 unification. This is a figure that I've taken from this paper by Hitoshi and uh, collaborators. 
from a couple of years ago. And, and this shows how, for instance, the seesaw extension of the standard model, the type one seesaw mechanism, uh, can be embedded into these uh, grand, unified, uh, uh, grand unified scenarios. And at the end of the day, you actually obtain a, a nice and consistent picture uh, that relates the generation of neutrino masses to leptogenesis but also to gravitational waves from cosmic strings, because in these scenarios, you have an extra symmetry breaking stage in the early universe that is responsible for generating the Majorana masses for the right handed neutrinos. That symmetry breaking stage gives rise to cosmic strings and hence gravitational waves. And on top of this, you can also make statements about uh, proton decay, for instance. This has been investigated uh, by these authors here in these two papers. Um, so one interesting example is, for instance, this breaking chain that starts at SO10 and then first reaches this gauge group here, the standard model gauge group times U1B minus L, uh, which, as long as it is unbroken, uh, protects or uh, leads to vanishing masses for right handed neutrinos. Uh, but then you spontaneously break U1B minus L in the early universe. You break it down just to the standard model gauge group. Uh, and this U1 symmetry breaking process then results in a network of metastable cosmic strings. Metastability here means that this network of cosmic strings will eventually collapse because quantum tunneling events will lead to the nucleation of SO10 monopole pairs along the strings. Yeah, so this is what you see here in this little cartoon. After U1 breaking, you have a network of cosmic strings, but those can break apart because at some point, uh, the fact that everything is embedded in SO10 kicks in, uh, and then those monopoles can nucleate spontaneously and lead to the collapse of the entire network. Um, a crucial assumption in such scenarios is that um, the two stages of symmetry breaking are separated by cosmic inflation. So in a sense, you still have to solve a monopole problem. I mean, this was one of the historic reasons for which inflation has been invented. Um, so first of all, you break SO10, uh, then you uh, dilute away, you inflate away any primordial abundance of monopoles, and only then you can proceed to the next symmetry breaking stage, which leads uh, to this network of metastable cosmic strings. If there's no inflation in this picture here, uh, those stages, those two stages of symmetry breaking would result in a string monopole gas uh, that would um, uh, disappear much faster and would not lead to such a strong signal in gravitational waves. All right. Um, one of the most important quantities, uh, if you want to describe uh, the dynamics of such a metastable cosmic string network, is the decay rate per string length. Uh, and this is what you see here on this slide. Uh, this expression has been worked out by these authors, uh, Velenkin and uh, others, uh, a long time ago. Uh, and uh, we are mostly, in, yeah, we are particularly interested in what we call gamma d. This is the number of nucleation events uh, per unit time, uh, per unit length. Uh, and that decay rate uh, depends on two crucial parameters. Uh, one you've seen before, this is the cosmic string tension mu. Uh, and the other one is the monopole mass, m. Uh, so the mass of those guys here, which nucleate along the cosmic strings. Uh, and then m enters into this dimensionless quantity kappa up here in the exponent. So kappa is a dimensionless quantity that quantifies, that parametrizes um, the hierarchy of symmetry breaking scales. Uh, the monopole mass uh, knows about the energy scale of SO10 breaking, and the cosmic string tension here down in the denominator knows about the energy scale of U1 symmetry breaking. Um, if that decay rate is non-zero, um, the cosmic strings will eventually decay. They will no longer be topologically stable, but they can decay on cosmological time scales. But when this happens exactly really depends on the size of this kappa parameter here and on how strongly the decay rate is exponentially suppressed. So imagine that all the relevant dynamics takes place roughly around the same energy scale. You have SO10, but also U1 breaking somewhere in the vicinity of the gut scale. Uh, then you would say that there's just a small hierarchy among those scales here and kappa or square root of kappa is some order one or up to order 10 parameter. That leads to a network of metastable cosmic strings that can decay in the early universe, still, for instance, doing radiation domination. On the other hand, if there really is a large separation of scales, many, maybe many orders of magnitude, then easily kappa can also be um, uh, yeah, as large as uh, uh, much larger than 10, for instance, or uh, even much, much larger. Um, and that can uh, lead to cosmic strings that are in principle 
uh, metastable or unstable, but whose lifetime is much, much longer than the age of the universe. And then uh, those sort of quasi-stable strings are practically indistinguishable from stable cosmic strings. Uh, another distinction one, another important distinction one has to make is that we can talk about uh, monopoles nucleating on these strings here, either with confined flux or without any un uh, without any unconfined magnetic flux. And that really depends on the details of the underlying particle physics model. So in the first case, if those monopoles still contain some flux um, that is not uh, captured by those strings that they are attached to, uh, then we really have to distinguish between monopoles and anti-monopoles, so M and, and M bar here. Uh, and once those monopoles and anti-monopoles have nucleated on the strings, that remaining segment uh, will evaporate or will uh, annihilate very fast because of the monopole antimonopole dynamics. Uh, those monopoles, antimonopoles, they interact with the uh, long range gauge field uh, and the energy will mostly be dissipated via the emission of massless gauge bosons. In that case, those remaining segments during the last moment of their existence uh, will not really significantly contribute to the gravitational wave spectrum. The alternative is that uh, those monopoles are sort of neutral, so they don't uh, interact with any um, uh, long range uh, gauge force. And in that case, uh, the remaining segment uh, will undergo some stage of oscillation and the only channel for losing its energy is emission of gravitational waves. In that scenario, we have another contribution to the overall gravitational wave spectrum. On the one hand, there's gravitational waves from loops as usual, but in that case of no unconfined flux, there's another contribution coming from another contribution to gravitational waves coming from those oscillating segments uh, at late times. All right, um, before we go on with a technical description uh, and in our estimate of the gravitational wave uh, spectrum, let me present uh, two simple examples, two scenarios, uh, microscopic theories where we actually produce a network of metastable cosmic strings. Um, the first one is again, the breaking of B minus L in the early universe, in that case after uh, inflation. So in a supersymmetric description, you may start with such a superpotential, some inflaton field, some B minus L Higgs fields, S and S bar, and some neutrino fields. Uh, the last operator here on the right-hand side is responsible for generating the neutrino masses upon symmetry breaking. And if it's such a higher dimensional operator, uh, we can assign B minus L charge of minus one to the Higgs field. Uh, and that means that no matter parity survives at low energy. So we really just break down everything to the standard model gauge group. Uh, there's no remaining Z2 meta parity. And in that case, uh, the U1 breaking really leads to a network of meta stable cosmic strings and not stable Z2 strings. Um, we investigated this model in quite a number of papers. So you see this uh, goes back many years. Uh, and even before we were interested in the signal of uh, gravitation away from cosmic strings. Uh, and well, I don't have time to go through this plot here, but we looked at um, the predictions for inflation and leptogenesis uh, and BBN and dark matter and so on. Uh, at the end of the day, we were able to identify some viable parameter space. And this is now a complete particle physics model, a consistent cosmology that really points to a specific range of this B minus L energy scale. So here we have a clear prediction uh, for the B minus L energy scale and also for the cosmic string tension. Um, if you prefer a slightly more minimal uh, scenario, I'd like to point you to this paper here by Buchmüller from uh, February last year. So in principle, all it takes to generate a network of metastable cosmic strings is this symmetry breaking chain. Uh, you start with some SU2 cross U1 symmetry, and you want to break it down to U1, like in the standard model, but you don't work with doublets right away. You first employ a triplet to break this down to U1 cross U1. Uh, that's the U1 subgroup of the SU2, uh, and that will produce SU2 monopoles. Then you have to invoke inflation to solve the monopole problem, uh, and then you can use doublets uh, to break that product group down to the remaining um, U1 symmetry at low energies. That U1 symmetry breaking will give rise to cosmic strings, uh, but they will be unstable against the nucleation of SU2 monopoles. And actually, uh, this is sort of um, a blueprint um, for uh, yeah, typical uh, symmetry breaking chains that you can observe in many models of grand unification. Uh, and then once this happens, um, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's very easy or it's, it's um, 
uh, it's it's easy to obtain a network of meta server cosmic strings, or you're basically guaranteed to obtain a network of meta server cosmic strings. Okay, so I still have uh, five minutes, and in these five minutes, I want to briefly say something about how we uh, describe um, the network of meta server cosmic strings from a more technical perspective. Um, there's one important time scale in the problem, and this is a time when, for the first time, nucleation events happen within the Hubble horizon. Uh, we can estimate this time scale in the following way. So consider the number of nucleation events along a string of length L after some time T. And we want to know uh, when does this number of nucleation events reach an order one value for horizon scale strings. Okay, so we put a length of the order of the Hubble horizon here, but the Hubble horizon just goes like time. So H inverse is nothing but a time T itself. So we are interested in the quantity gamma times uh, T squared. Uh, and, and that quantity obviously is one of order one at some time that is given as one over the square root of this decay rate. So now we have a typical time scale TS, which is controlled by the decay rate that distinguishes between two regimes. At much earlier times, much uh, earlier before the end of the scaling regime, everything is just as in the standard case. We're in the scaling regime. Uh, we've got a network of loops that emit gravitational waves, but they don't decay yet into segments on sub-horizon scales. And they're long strings. Uh, they chop off closed loops. The gravitational wave emission is negligible. And they can decay into longer segments, but those events are very rare and are separated by very large distances uh, so that those events typically only happen on super horizon scales. Then at late times, everything changes, the picture changes completely, and we enter what we call the decay regime. So now nucleation events happen very frequently inside the Hubble horizon. Uh, and that means the loops, they still continue to emit gravitational waves, but they can also break up and uh, give rise to a new population of segments from uh, disintegrating, disintegrating loops. And we have the long strings in the network that also break up into segments. So now there's a new population of segments from long strings and those segments can break up again and again and again, uh, which gives rise to a population of segments from segments from segments and so on and so forth. Um, so we describe uh, these different populations of string uh, elements, string components in terms of um, kinetic equations, yeah? That's uh, what you see here on this slide for the number densities of loops with a little circle on top and the number density of segments with a little tilde on top. And I don't really have enough time to, well, talk about all the details of those kinetic equations, but let me just briefly mention that um, there is a source term uh, which follows from, um, which takes the standard form in the scaling regime. Um, a source term which we put to zero in the decay regime, uh, and then new source terms for these new populations, segments from loops and segments from segments. Uh, those number densities are number densities per unit length. So we also have to know how the string length evolves as a function of time. That requires some extra work. And at the end of the day, the challenge is to solve the set of partial integral differential equations uh, at early times, at late times, so both in the scaling regime and the decay regime, uh, and match those solutions at the transition between the two regimes. And because we're interested in um, the background evolution, background expansion, we have to do it both in radiation domination and meta domination. Um, so, running time, so, yeah, we're running out of time. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, I think I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, I just want to flash at you one result uh, for such a number density. Now, uh, the new... Um, observation is that the number densities begin to become exponentially suppressed as soon as basically the lifetime of the network uh, is, is reached. Um, so basically you have a new exponential function inside these number densities, uh, which is given uh, basically as the averaged number of decay events uh, for some average loop length uh, times the time interval uh, since the beginning of this decay regime. Um, and now we have a time resolved picture of loop decay independence of the loop length and time, uh, which had not been achieved before. And we do this for all the number densities uh, that we need to consider loops, segments, and so on. Um, and then, as you know, uh, those number densities are the crucial input to calculate the gravitational wave spectrum. Uh, so this is a standard formula, uh, but now we just put in our new results for the number density uh, and can calculate the gravitational wave spectrum, uh, which you see here on the left-hand side. 
uh, the colorful lines are for different values of the cosmic string tension, and the dashed uh, gray lines are for stable cosmic strings. So now we find that um, the spectrum is dominated by the emission from loops. Uh, we can find uh, the exact behavior at low frequencies and update some earlier results. Uh, and we find that uh, we can now explain the PTA signal uh, for much larger values of GMU, because now there is a suppression in the spectrum. That means we can actually push the cosmic string tension to slightly larger values, still explain the PTA signal, uh, and then get a larger prediction here uh, at LIGO, inter, uh, LIGO frequencies. All right, so I think this is an important punchline and a good point to stop. I will skip this slide and jump ahead to my conclusion. So I talked about metastable over cosmic strings. They are predicted in many models of grand unification uh, when combined with inflation to solve the monopole problem. Uh, there are exciting predictions for PTAs, uh, but also for interferometer to experiment at higher frequencies. And in the next step, we want to explore other directions in parameter space. It's very important to uh, back up our results by numerical simulations that is on our uh, wish list. Um, and it's interesting to ask uh, whether any other uh, observational signatures. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention.